thought I'd preach from the floor tonight and uh, just for the sake of change. Um, I suppose that that's me tampering with tradition and whatnot. But, well, you know, change is good every once in a while. Uh, we left off last time in the book of Jude and uh, it's really hard to give Jude the justice it deserves in two lessons so I uh, decided to break Excuse me, it's really hard to give Jude the justice it deserves in one lesson, so I decided to break it into two. I guess two is probably not enough to exhaust it either, but in any case, I want to look again at what the uh, epistle to Jude says, and like last time, I want to begin by reading the book of Jude. It's good to hear the book in context. Before we do anything else, we will read through the 25 verses here again. Jude, a bondservant of Jesus Christ and brother of James, to those who are the called, beloved in God the Father, and kept for Jesus Christ, may mercy and peace and love be multiplied to you. Beloved, while I was making every effort to write to you about our common salvation, I felt the necessity to write to you appealing that you contend earnestly for the faith which was once for all handed down to the saints. For certain persons have crept in unnoticed, those who were long beforehand marked out for this condemnation, ungodly persons who turn the grace of our God into licentiousness and deny our Master and Lord Jesus Christ. I desire to remind you, though you know all things once for all, that the Lord, after saving a people out of the land of Egypt, subsequently destroyed those who did not believe. And angels who did not keep their own domain, but abandoned their proper abode, he has kept in eternal bonds under darkness for the judgment of the great day. He, just as Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities around them, since they in the same way as these indulged in gross immorality and went after strange flesh, and are exhibited as an example in undergoing the punishment of eternal fire. And in the same way, these men also by dreaming defile the flesh, and reject authority and revile angelic majesties. Michael, the archangel, when he disputed with the devil and argued about the body of Moses, did not dare pronounce against him a railing judgment, but said, The Lord rebuke you. But these men revile the things which they do not understand, and the things which they know. By instinct, like unreasoning animals, by these things they are destroyed. Woe to them! For they have gone the way of Cain, and for pay they have rushed headlong into the error of Balaam, and perished in the rebellion of Korah. These are the men who are hidden reefs in your love feasts, when they feast with you without fear, caring for themselves, clouds without water, carried along by the winds, autumn trees without fruit, doubly dead, uprooted, wild waves of the sea, casting up their own shame like foam, wandering stars for whom the black darkness has been reserved forever. It was about these men also that Enoch in the seventh generation from Adam prophesied, saying, Behold, the Lord came with many thousands of His holy ones to execute judgment upon all and to convict all the ungodly of all their ungodly deeds which they have done in an ungodly way and of all the harsh things which ungodly sinners have spoken against Him. These are grumblers, finding fault, following after their own lusts. They speak arrogantly, flattering people for the sake of gaining an advantage. But you, beloved, ought to remember the words that were spoken beforehand by the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ, that they were saying to you in the last time there will be mockers following after their own ungodly lusts. These are the ones who cause divisions, worldly-minded, devoid of the Spirit. But you, beloved, building yourselves up on your most holy faith, praying in the Holy Spirit, Keep yourselves in the love of God, waiting anxiously for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ to eternal life. And have mercy on some who are doubting. Save others, snatching them out of the fire. And on some have mercy with fear, hating even the garment polluted by the flesh. Now to Him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to make you stand in the presence of His glory, blameless with great joy, to the only God our Savior, through Jesus Christ our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion, and authority before all time and now and forever. Amen. Yeah, just some points to note in passing you know, as we, before we jump back into the text where we left off is you'll notice there's this emphasis on ungodliness. In verse 4, we see that these false teachers are ungodly persons. They turn the grace of God into licentious behavior. And in verse 18, uh, we see that these uh, mockers that the apostles prophesied about would be following after their own ungodly lusts. And 
in verse 15, we see that this statement is made, uh, this quote from 1 Enoch 1 and verse 9, and you'll notice the word ungodly is used four times in that quote. Uh, it's important to realize, you know, when we talk about being godly and being ungodly, uh, you know, I think, and I made this mistake for a while, so I'm sure somebody else has got to be doing it too. You know, people hear the word godly and they think godlike, and that's not really what that word means. What that means is more in the sense of piety. It's the kind of behavior that God wants, not the kind of behavior that God Himself engages. You know, you don't become like God, but being godly is rather, you know, the idea of piety an impiety here. People who just don't care about morality anymore. People who just don't care about the way they act. No one's going to tell me how to live. No one, especially not God. That's an ungodly person right there. Uh, so that, that, that's a subtle distinction to make, but it's one I think it's important to note. You'll notice that Jude also makes an emphasis on judgment. The false teachers in verse 4, he says, were marked out for condemnation long ago. In verse 6, he says that there's judgment even reserved for the angels. There were angels who sinned. They're being kept in bonds as they await for the judgment of the great day. Uh, by contrast, we realize that judgment is the prerogative of God. Not even Michael the archangel, the ruling angel, dared to pronounce a railing judgment. In verse, uh, verse 9, he left that to God's domain. The Lord rebuke you, he said. And in verse 15, we learn again that this judgment, uh, that the Lord comes to execute judgment on all of those ungodly people. There is a promise made by the Lord that those who continue to willfully persist in an ungodly character and an ungodly lifestyle will face the judgment of God. And similarly, we see an emphasis on this key term of keep. We are kept. We are kept for Jesus Christ. It says that in verse 1. But there's a lot of people that aren't keeping their place. Angels did not keep their place in verse 6. And so therefore God keeps them in chains. The black darkness we learn in verse 13 is being kept. It's being reserved for these wicked people in verse 13. But if we are kept by God, and people who do not keep their own place are going to be kept for judgment, what should we do? We should keep ourselves in the love of God. And that's what the point of verse 21 is. Keep yourselves in the love of God. And really, I think that verse 21 is the point of the whole letter when you really think about it. Uh, he opens with a statement, you know, that appealing to them that you contend earnestly for the faith. Fight for the faith, he says. And that's important. That's, you know, the, the reason which he writes. But how do we fight for the faith? Do we go out and you know, beat people up that disagree with us? Do we you know, hunt down all those false teachers and make sure that they're written up in the publications of our choice? Or do we, uh, you know, do we make it our job to smoke out the heretics? Do we just behave wickedly towards everybody? Do we act with suspicion towards others? Well, it, it seems to me that you know, the way Jude defines fighting for the faith ultimately boils down to verses 20 and 21. Even though all these false teachers are behaving this way, Build yourselves up in the holy faith. Keep yourselves in the love of God. People lose sight of that idea too quickly, I think, uh, when it comes time to fighting for the faith. And it makes sense. He spends the bulk of this letter talking about how bad these false teachers are. It kind of makes you angry, you know? I mean, re read some of these things. We left off in verse 12. Read some of the ways he describes these people. Hidden reefs in your love feasts. Uh, feasting without fear. Um... You know, there's this... Uh, before we can talk about what hidden reefs in the love feasts are, perhaps we should talk about what love feasts are in the first place. Um, <laughs> love feasts, literally just loves, it's the plural form of the word agape, but, uh, but it refers to concrete love actions. And in this context, it's clearly talking about something feast-related because he says they're feasting with you without fear uh, in verse 12. Uh, but the false teachers are reefs in this feast. They are some kind of disruption to that love feast. Um, now, it, it seems to me that this is probably just a reference to the Lord's Supper. I mean, what other feast could he possibly be talking about here? You know, what other possible idea? You know, I mean, you know, some people have extrapolated this whole idea, this whole theology about fellowship meals from this one verse, and that seems to me to be too much, reading too much into the text. No, but on the contrary, what feast is better characterized as the feast of love than, well, the feast that we eat uh, whenever we partake of the Lord's body and blood, I suspect. 
And it may be that the error here is the same as what we saw in 1 Corinthians chapter 11 where uh, people were taking their own supper first and one is hungry and another is drunk. They were turning the Lord's supper into their own supper. Um, and regardless of whether that is the case or not, we see that these false teachers are not behaving as they should when it came time to partake the Lord's Supper, when it came time to eat this love feast, and they're creating this reef of sorts in there. Um, and I see no, I mean, it, this verse doesn't really radically change anything in our thought about the Lord's Supper. I think that love feast is just another legitimate name for it. Um, but there you go. Um, another comment can be made that the, the problem is, in verse 12, that they are caring for themselves. Why did Jesus die for our sins? Is it because He cared for Himself? Because He cared about getting His way all the time? No. He cared about others. He, and in the same way, you know, in 1 Corinthians 11, Paul's whole indictment against the Corinthians was that you know, you all care too much about yourself. You care too much about eating your own stomach. You know, you have houses to eat and drink in, but what is this? You've, one is hungry and another is drunk, he says. You despise the church of God and shame those who have nothing? In this I will not praise you, Paul said. Well, it's the same idea here in some ways. It might, there might be some specific differences in the scenario, but ultimately, you know, the way that you, the meaning of the Lord's Supper determines how we treat one another. The fact that Jesus came and died for our sins has implications for how we behave towards one another. And so ultimately, regardless of whether you think this is the Lord's Supper or not, the application is still the same. That, you know, we're not supposed to be caring for ourselves. We're supposed to be caring for others. Clouds without water. That doesn't sound like a very happy description. Uh, empty, waterless clouds. It's an in, image of instability. Uh, you get this image of uh, you get this picture in your head, kind of, of a lack of substance from waterless clouds. Proverbs. Uh, he's probably borrowing this language from Proverbs 25 and verse 14. Uh, like clouds and wind without rain is a man who boasts of his gifts falsely. And of course, you know, they're carried along by winds. You get the idea of a man who he can't make up his mind. He just latches on to whatever idea seems most convenient for him at the time. Oh, you ever meet people like that? You know, they're, they're, the only thing they're consistent about, you know, is what serves their best interests. Oh, you change your view on that. You're not being consistent. Oh, you said one thing over here. You said another thing over here. Well, he's being 100% consistent. He's not consistent in what he says, but he's consistent in his reasons for doing it. His reasons for doing it is because I am 100% consistently serving self, is what it is. Uh, you know, we accuse politicians of that kind of thing all the time. Every politician is completely consistent. They make all of their decisions 100% you know, in the ways of advancing their career further and getting reelected and things like that. But this people, human nature is like that. Consistency is, you know, this idea of being self-serving. But as a result of that, they appear to be carried along by winds. Autumn trees, without fruit, doubly dead and uprooted. You get this image of something that's not very useful, not very functional. The whole point of a fruit tree is to produce fruit, but if a tree is not producing fruit, it's not fulfilling its function. It's similar to Jesus' condemnation of the fruitless fig tree in Luke chapter 13 and verse 6. He began telling them this parable. A man had a fig tree which had been planted in his vineyard. He came looking for fruit on it and did not find any. He said to the vineyard keeper, Behold, for three years I have come looking for fruit on this fig tree without finding any. Cut it down. Why does it even use up the ground? He answered and said to him, Let it alone, sir, for this year too, until I dig around it and put in fertilizer. And if it bears fruit next year, fine. But if not, cut it down. You know, one of the things that false teachers do is they don't produce any fruit. And you know them by the fact that they don't produce fruit, or they produce bad fruit. They are doubly dead and uprooted. Wild waves of the sea, verse 13, casting up their shame like foam. This, you get this picture of instability and chaos. You know, shameless behavior. People that just can't make up their mind. Again, casting up their own shame like foam. Here, look at this. Just flaunt their bad behavior. Uh, wandering stars for whom the black darkness is reserved forever. Interesting astronomy fact. Anybody know where the word planet comes from? 
The word planet means wanderer. The Greeks called the things in the sky that, uh, the stars were the things that stayed fixed, the planets were the things that moved around. Kind of a fun fact here, but these are planeting stars in the Greek. Uh, I don't know if Jude saw that astronomical irony in years later, but uh, regardless of what that is, uh, you know, you get this again picture of an astronomical contradiction in terms in some way. They're not fixed in the skies; they're just doomed to wander in the black darkness forever. Now, why why not just say they're bad people? You know, why resort to all of this metaphorical imagery? Well, you know, Jude. Jude's using all these word pictures to kind of give you this idea of how horrible these people really are. It's one thing to get up in the pulpit and say, false teachers are bad, and they're shameful, and they're unstable. It's another thing to say that they are waterless clouds, and dead autumn trees, and wild waves of the sea, and wandering stars in the darkness. Now, now you've got all these cool word pictures in your head that you can associate with them. And then he gets in verses 14 and 15 to this little quote from Enoch. And uh, this, is a, this is an actual work. Uh, in the book of First Enoch is an ancient apocryphal work describing, you know, it describes a lot of different things. It's very long and apocalyptic. Um, I have a copy of it actually somewhere but, or that's been translated. It was originally written in Ethiopic. Um, but this was a real thing. The ancients would have known about it. You can find it in the Dead Sea Scrolls. And specifically assigns the uh, angelic intermarriages to the time of Jared the patriarch. It's very rare that somebody actually regards the book of First Enoch as scripture. I just want to say that up front. Even among the Jews, that's a rare thing. It was probably not written by the actual Enoch either. Uh, First Enoch was a, what we call a pseudepigraphal work. In the second and third centuries, the Jews had a habit of, they would write they would write ancient works in tribute of some famous patriarchal figure. Uh, and you can find the Apocalypse of Adam and the Testament of Abraham and uh, all of Jacob's sons have a book named after them somewhere. It's just on and on and on. They, they really liked, they, they did this as a kind of a way of paying historical tribute. And they did, they wrote one with Enoch and Enoch is one of the longer ones and one of the better preserved ones actually. But Jude quotes from 1 Enoch chapter 1 and verse 9. And he, uh, it's interesting, he says that Enoch prophesied in the seventh generation from Adam. How do we deal with that? Enoch? Does Jude think Enoch is inspired scripture? Well, you know, there's other ways to take that. I mean, Paul quotes from uh, pagan work, Epimenides' Paradox, and says that that's a prophet of their own that said that. Uh, all Cretans are liars, evil beasts, lazy gluttons. Uh, Titus chapter 1 and verse 12. Or we might think of you know, how prophecy itself can be an unwitting thing. That you know, Some statement got made and God determined ahead of time that it would be prophetic. Well, we have precedence for that in scripture as well. Uh, John chapter 11 and verse Verses 49 through 52, Caiaphas predicts that it is more expedient for one man to die on behalf of the people than for all people to perish. But Caiaphas doesn't realize this, but he's, John says he's actually prophesying. He's prophesying about how Jesus is going to die on behalf of the whole nation, and not only the nation, but indeed all the world. So there's precedence for um, unwitting prophecy, and there's precedence for calling people who are not prophets, prophets. Uh, so I, I think we probably shouldn't make too much of Jude's quote from First Enoch here. Um, the quote opens with Enoch's allusion to Deuteronomy 33. God appears among the 10,000 angels, it's like at Mount Sinai. And God comes with these angels not to deliver a law, but to deliver judgment in the context of Enoch. Now, fourfold repetition of the word ungodly. They are the recipients of said judgment. And the point, the reason Jude quotes this, in case, um, before I lose anybody on this, the reason Jude quotes this is to say this, that whatever else we say or do or don't say or don't do about these false teachers, their judgment is inescapable. And you can find this anywhere. You can find this even in a book like First Enoch. People, well, this has been something that is, this is a recognized fact from the beginning. It's all over the Old Testament. It's all over your Apocrypha. It's all over everything. And now here, it's here in Jude. Um, and so the point is, whatever else we say or do about false teachers, their judgment for ungodliness is inescapable. In verse 16, he again describes their actions. They're grumblers. What is a grumbler? A grumbler is a person who complains about everything. He finds fault with everything. 
Uh, there's no way to satisfy a grumbler. There's no way to satisfy their pet peeves. You give them what they want, they're going to want more. Oh, you, didn't, you need to fix this. Okay, we fixed that. Oh, you need to fix this over here. Oh, okay, well, and it goes on and on. And there's no way to sal satisfy their pet peeves and their silly doctrinal agenda. You know, it's not enough for them to simply have a preference. They must bind that preference on everybody else. Their preference must be the law. That's what a false teacher is. A false teacher is somebody who takes what God has not bound and binds it to people anyway, as if it was handed down from on high. It's not enough for me to simply like a tradition a certain way, you know. Like some people might like, you know, the preacher in the pulpit. Some people might like the preacher on the floor in a more close, personal, intimate setting. And it's fine to have a preference one way or another. But if somebody gets up and says, you know, I think it has to be this way, and this is the way God wants it to be, conveniently, God always seems to share the opinions of people who seem to have such insight into these things. Uh, well, they have a problem there when we're grumbling about such things. They're always finding fault. They're always following after their own lusts. The rules don't seem to apply to them. You know, you hear stories about this kind of thing. You know, like a preacher who, you know, he preaches this hard line view on marriage and divorce and remarriage. And then one day his daughter announces that she's getting a divorce. And then the next day, hey, his view changed. How convenient. How how, how easy to function in that respect? Well, you know, again, what we have is uh, an instance of somebody where the rules just don't apply consistently to them. You know, it strikes me as just a little bit too convenient on that point. They like to find fault with everybody else, but you can't judge me, you can't tattle on me, you can't uh, oppress me for behaving in my way. They are arrogant. They speak arrogantly. In other words, these people have all the answers. And nobody can teach these people anything. There's nothing they can learn from anybody else around them because they got it all figured out. We all know people like that. You know, I'm, you know, I'm a, <laughs> that's one of my biggest fears in life is becoming that person. Uh, I have to struggle with that every day. I have a problem with pride and I know it. You know, so then there's the danger. Never, never think in life that you have all the answers. Never think that you are unteachable, that you have all of the great insights. That's not a good thing to be. They are flattering. And, you know, we're not, when we talk about being flattering, we're not just talking about showering somebody with unnecessary compliments. Oh, that was just so amazing, so wonderful. And, you know, we're talking about this practice of showing favoritism as well. Um, Another instance of this in 2 Timothy chapter 4, in verses 3 and 4, the time will come when the, they will not, the people will not endure sound doctrine, but wanting to have their ears tickled. They will accumulate for themselves teachers in accordance with their own desires, will turn away their ears from the truth, and will turn aside to, to myths. Not only do you have a, a problem with false teachers, you have a problem in some ways with false audiences. People who are not interested in truth, they are interested in, well... Tickling the ears. Making you feel good about yourself. And what does an ear-tickling preacher look like? You know, well, an ear-tickling preacher, in a nutshell, is one who you know, tells you you don't have anything to change. You don't have anything you need to change about your life. No, you're doing just fine the way you are. Everything's looking great in this church. No need to change anything here. Y'all are perfect in every way. Said no true prophet of Israel ever. Said no true preacher of the gospel ever. If we have an understanding of who Jesus is, we have an understanding of who the standard for our living is, we'll realize we're not meeting that standard. We are we got a lot of work to do. I individually in my life have a lot of work to do in terms of coming into conformity with a crucified Christ. And if we're honest with ourselves, I think every single one of us will realize that. We've got a long way to go. The last thing in the world you want is someone coming in and telling you that you're already perfect. And your church is already perfect. And everything you're doing right is already perfect. No. Watch it. Beware of that man. That man is a false teacher. Tickling the ears and telling people only what they want to hear in order to continue a life of self-indulgence and selfish gain, that's not the way we're supposed to work. And we all know somebody like this. I know people like this all the time. It's frustrating. It makes me mad. It makes me angry. And what do we do about these false teachers, you know? What do we do about these phony Christians? Well, Jude answers that question. He says, remember the words of the apostles. It's not your job to smoke these people out. 
It's not your job to hunt these people down in some kind of false teacher witch hunt. Oh, but the, they'll just go on saying false things. We've got to stop these people. We've got to silence them. What exactly are we afraid of? Well, that God won't judge them? That they'll get away with it? Nobody gets away with anything. You know, this one thing, one thing we need to realize, there is not a person in the world who gets away with being a false teacher. They might get away with it in this life. But what is this life compared to eternity? Come on. You know, it's, it doesn't even work that way. Getting away with something is relative. No one gets away with anything. He says, remember the words of the apostles. The words of the apostles was that there will be mockers following after their own ungodly lust in the last times. Well, guess what? We've been living in the last times since Jesus was here. We have been, you know, false teachers are not a sign of the end. They're something that will always exist. They have always existed. They will always exist. Now, he might be quoting 2 Peter 3, 3 here, assuming that 2 Peter was written first. There's always going to be people like this. You're not going to get rid of them. And if you make it your mission in life to get rid of them, it's not going to end well. It's not possible. Now you meet one, yes, you refute him, you silence him. You know, but if you think there's something wrong in the, in the church, I, I meet people all the time, they think it's their job to, to fix the, what, what, what's wrong with the church, and they're using church in a weird way, which hybridizes universal and local. Which don't even get me started on that problem. They think it's their job to fix what's wrong with the, you know, the brotherhood as a whole. And, and that's to me, it's just it's too big of a task for one man. It's too big of a task for any man, for all of mankind. God is the one who sanctifies and justifies, and God is the one who will ultimately find all these people. Who is the heretic? I'll tell you something. A heretic is its not like the church fathers defined it. And a heretic is not a person who has trouble articulating you know, side points like the doctrine of the Trinity. A heretic is somebody who causes division. A heretic is somebody who is worldly minded. A heretic is a person who is devoid of the Spirit. These are the ones who cause divisions. Worldly minded, devoid of the Spirit. In verse 19, but what? Now, the problem is when we become too fixated on this world... We're already devoid of the Spirit. When we're too fixated on solving problems by human means, we become like them. We think we can solve when we see things only through the human lens. When we think that our goals can be accomplished by human wisdom. You know, if we think that that's the way to solve the heretic problem, well, perhaps that we're thinking a little too much like them. But what do we do? Verses 20 through 23. Build yourselves up on your most holy faith. Pray in the Holy Spirit. So important. Keep yourself in the love of God. That's exhibit A of what it means to fight for the faith. Fighting for the faith doesn't mean that we use pulpits to lambast people we disagree with. Fighting for the faith doesn't mean we gossip behind the back of some brother we disagree with. Fighting for the faith means we keep ourselves in God's love. And if we keep ourselves in God's love, perhaps we'll treat people with love a little more. Perhaps we'll be a little kinder to people. Perhaps we'll be a little more forbearing. Perhaps we'll use a little more common sense and discernment in our dealings with people. In the process of this, we must eagerly await the mercy of our Lord Jesus for eternal life. When does that come? Well, it comes at the same time the judgment does. Yes, there's a judgment coming for false teachers, but there's also a hope coming. If there isn't a hope, why are you a Christian? Why are you doing this, I might ask? Christianity is not about you know, winning an argument. It's about saving souls. It's about saving your soul. It's not about getting mad and fleeing to some other congregation when something happens we don't like. It's about encouraging and edifying and equipping. That's a hard lesson for me. You know, I mean, I, I, I get frustrated. I get discouraged. And when it comes to, you know, blatantly obvious facts, in my mind anyway, I present a blatantly obvious fact, and people, you know, they don't see it. I just don't see it that way. But at the end of the day, who should I really be frustrated with? Well, I must confess, my greatest disappointments still come from myself. So maybe I should keep myself in the love of God a little more. Maybe we all should. <laughs> Now just a couple of points here in verses 22 and 23. You know, 
having mercy on some who are doubting, save others, snatching them out of the fire. Some have mercy without fear, hating even the garment polluted by the flesh. There's a need, there's a need for discrimination and discipline. How do you tell the difference? Well, use your brain. Some people we have mercy on. Some people we need to be a little more forbearing towards because they're not in the same place. And some people we need to crack down on a little better. Well, how do we tell the difference? There is a difference between disciplining and admonishing a new Christian who doesn't know any better and disciplining and admonishing a, Christ, a man who has been a Christian for 60 years and should know better. <laughs> you know, when my daughter Leah was born, you know what she would look like? She looked... Would stare up at the ceiling, mouth hanging open, didn't have a lot of cognitive skills, couldn't hold her head up. She was just still, you know, she's still processing the world around her. She doesn't, she hasn't developed, so to speak. She's just a baby. She wasn't super responsive to things that, in the ways that we could tell anyway. The way she was acting was considered normal. But I'll tell you something, she was still doing that right now. You know, right now she's cooing and giggling and you know doing that. What if she was still staring up at the ceiling, mouth gaping open, not really responding to things? Would you think there was something wrong? Would you think that she wasn't developing properly? Get that baby some help, people would say. You know? And John, if John were acting the way he did when he was born, you know, you'd say, get that baby some help. There's something not right. He's not maturing the way he should be. He's not developing the way he should be. You know? We understand that with physical children. We understand that there's an acceptable and unacceptable level of development. But somehow people miss that when it comes to spiritual things, you know. When you become a Christian, you're that babe in Christ. Sitting there, your mouth gaping open, you're just a sponge, you're absorbing everything. Perhaps you're not absorbing everything. What about the man who's been a Christian his whole life and doesn't know anything? can't tell you where something is in his Bible. He offers the same cliché, thoughtless comments in his prayers. He still treats everybody around him the way a non-Christian would treat them. He still says nothing of substance in Bible class. He's still never prepared to worship God. He's never prepared to do anything. He's just acting like anyone who was a babe in Christ still would. And he's living a moral life the way some babe in Christ would. Would you think there's something wrong in that development process? Get that man some help. And so really what we see is that discipline, according to Jude, is a case-by-case -case basis. Some of them you have to snatch, and some of them you have to be a little more gentle with, depending on you know, disposition, depending on experience. You know, if a man gets baptized today and tomorrow goes and commits fornication, we're going to have a talk. But if somebody who's in this room who's been a Christian for years and years goes out and commits fornication, we're going to have a very different kind of talk. One, one talk is going to be more about educating somebody that, hey, you can't do this anymore, this isn't right. Another one is going to be, no, you should know better than this because this is against everything you are as a person. This is against your very identity that you now have in Christ, that you have had in Christ. So, how do we tell the difference? Well, we need to exercise judgment. We need to, you know, again, use our brains to discern things. The other thing I would note in all of this is that teaching always affects our practice. You know, it's... Jude... <laughs> Jude doesn't do this weird thing that we've sometimes done with outlining biblical books where we split them up and here's the doctrinal section and the practical section. So the apostles would have looked at you funny if you'd set, spoken of it that way because reality is that you know all doctrine is ultimately practical. And all of our practices are ultimately... The word doctrine just means teaching anyway. There's the other problem with that approach. But I'm not knocking that for saying we can't summarize the contents of books in certain ways. But we need to realize that you know, that's not the distinction that Jude is making. You think what you teach doesn't affect how you live? You think how you live doesn't affect what you teach? You know, anything that downplays who Jesus is that diminishes His role as the crucified Savior, that diminishes His authority as the, the guiding standard by which we must live our lives, that's going to affect how you live. That's going to change the kind of person you are. You know, something that makes Jesus a little less selfless is going to make us a little less selfless as well. And the primary motivation of false teachers throughout this book has been what? Selfishness. Lust. Sensuality. False teacher is not just a man with an honest, studied disagreement. You know, I mean, I meet people all the time 
who, you know, they've studied their Bible diligently and they've come to different conclusions than I have. Does that make them false teachers? Does that make me a false teacher? No. False teachers motivated by false motives. Like our proverbial man that we talked about before where, uh, you know, he changes his view because his daughter got a divorce. That's a little more selfishly motivated. That's a little more, you know, geared towards justifying the actions of a family member. And the false teacher isn't obvious. He pretends to be something he's not. Hence the false part of it. Interesting to me. It's always interesting to me how Jesus, in the same chapter, he said, "Do not judge." He also said, "You will know them by their fruits." That sounds like you know there's a judgment call that some sort that needs to be made, doesn't there? Um, but the main issue that Jesus addresses is not judging in the way that our society defines it. It's hypocrisy. We need to be careful in condemning others if we're practicing something that could be construed as the same thing. And finally, well, you know, there's a. It's interesting to me how you know Jude places the priority in dealing with personal spiritual well-being. The way you deal with false teaching is keep yourselves in the love of God. Keep yourself, build yourselves up in the holy faith. All these elements. It's not go fix these people. It's work on you. Fix yourself. That's how you deal with false teachers. Well, that seems a little counterintuitive, you know, because our, our gut reaction is to jump into refutation mode. Somebody's wrong. We've got to stop them or they'll continue being wrong. Well, you know, I, I mean, if I had a dollar for every time I thought I could prove someone wrong about something and failed to do it, <laughs> you know, somebody is wrong on the Internet. <laughs> How many times have I gotten involved in that discussion? Well, it's human pride that says that you can fix people with one conversation and, or, you know, persistent trolling. No. Human in that way, if I think I can fix them in that way, perhaps I'm a little wrong myself. But I have, you know, I'm personally striven in my teaching to try to put more focus not on, you know, refuting every specific false doctrine that's out there, because there's a lot of them. I've tried to emphasize more, let's go to the text, let's read the text and learn what it says, learn what the truth is that God is conveying to us. And, you know, I, I firmly believe that you know, the Word has the same power it did years and years ago. It, a firm emphasis on what the truth is will help us to recognize what the error is. Uh, there are times and there are places, no, don't get me wrong, there's times and places to discuss and to reject specific ideas that are out there. But the bulk of teaching needs to come from the Word of God and not you know, from a goal of refuting some idea that's out there. You know, more practical energy, you know, if we put the... You know, some people put the same amount of energy into learning the Word and the teaching it as they did to smoking out the heretics. They can make a profound difference. But what about myself? You know, my energy and fault finding were devoted into, well, you know, teaching the lost and saving souls and making something, you know, promoting the gospel. What if I turn the energy I put into, you know, finding problems with people into my own personal spiritual growth, my prayer life, my family life, my study of the Word. Well, that might look considerably different. But what about the rest of us? Well, perhaps we're the same way. The only way we can truly fight for the faith is to keep ourselves in the love of God. That's Jude's method. To get back to the basics. To get back to the beginning. The Holy Faith. The Holy Spirit. The love of God and the eternal life in Christ. Those are the first principles. Now, to him who is able to keep you from stumbling, there's that word again, keep, and to make you stand in the presence of his glory, blameless, with great joy. And how awesome is that going to be? To the only God our Savior, through Jesus Christ our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion, and authority before all time, and now, and forever. Amen. Before the world was, right now, and long after the world has passed away. Praise God. And perhaps if we do a little more of that, we put more of our energy into glorifying God, it'll change us, it'll change those around us. It might have a profound impact on the gospel in ways that we cannot even begin to imagine. Now perhaps if you're here tonight and you realize that you have not fought for the faith like you should, you have not kept yourself in the love of God like you ought to have, 
Well, an opportunity is always given, and here it is now, to make your life right with the Lord. Seek out encouragement. Seek out edification. Seek out the equipping of the holy faith. Your brethren are here to help keep you in God's love. If there's anything we can do for you, let it be known. Let's stand and sing at this time. <laughs>